and leave me home. Oh, thank you, Lord. Yeah. Give God a praise. Are you glad to be here today? Well, I think I heard somebody say yeah on this side, but I didn't hear anybody say yeah. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? God bless you. We're just sending a greeting to everybody out there. Just stand as we worship him today. Give him praise. Give him glory. And honor his name. We're going to bless the Lord today as we do most of the time. Bless him. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful where the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. For I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Come on, help me sing. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me. When the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. On the road of mark with suffering, though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to pray. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory, your name. Give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Give and take away. You give and take away. Heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let me hear you. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. One more time. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, oh, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, give God praise today, yeah, bless his name. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, being on the everlasting arm. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, being on the everlasting arm. 
your chest breaks a man. Hallelujah. Break him down to his knees. God, I've been broken more, more than a time or two. Anybody been broken in the room today? He picked me up and showed me what it means to be a man. Oh, oh, my hope. Days gone. All my sins are forgiven. I've been washed by your blood. All my hope is in. Days gone. All my sins are forgiven. I've been washed by the blood. Hallelujah. Been washed by. Been washed by the blood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus. For my soul. 
God bless you. Pastor, come on up. Doc, thank you, man. You know, the last few things you were singing is where we're headed today. So, so glad of that. Last week, got cut off, uh, ran out of time, had too much left to do, and you were looking hungry, and I was getting concerned. So, uh, we just kind of chopped it. Well, we're going to come back in where we chopped off and kind of pick up. If you missed last week, you might want to go back and watch it, and uh, it'll kind of put these two together a little bit. It will help. Now, one of the things that we're adding, just as just comments to get started, uh, I've been getting yelled at by certain people about not having takeaways on the back desk back there. Uh, They're there again. So if you want to take away of the takeaways to take home, uh, stop by the, the uh, Welcome Center desk and pick those up. And for those who are guests, when I go to the takeaways at the end, you'll understand what I'm, I'm talking about. You know, one of the things for prayer this morning that's just pressing in on me is uh, Doris's son, Ken Wilson, and his family live in Oregon. And Oregon's on fire. Washington's on fire. California's on fire. Uh, horrific fires. It's not uncommon uh, that they happen every year, but it does seem to be a lot more than, than typical on that. Uh, her son, Ken's church, has burned up. The pastor, I don't know, I hadn't heard the update whether his house was burned or not. Yeah. Not yet, but it's in the way. It's, it's kind of... as. Okay, so there, there's a lot of people suffering there, and that just kind of hurt me when, when something like that uh, gets burned up in the midst of everything else. So I want us to pray for them, particularly, and, uh, and it, it is in line for Ken's house as well. So they're concerned about their place and a lot of others out there. So uh, let's just kind of remember them as we pray this morning. Father, we thank you that though we're here in a very safe environment, protected by integrity as well as your favor, uh, Father, we thank you that, uh, that we're not experiencing things like others around the United States are having to go through. Father, but we do know people are suffering out west uh, because of these fires. And Lord, it's, it's, it's one of those things that we could look at with a cynical eye and and blame the upheaval of what's going on in the rest of our country out there. But Lord, these are just folks that are suffering. And we care more about that than we do any of the other things associated with with what's going on in America right now. So Father, protect those folks, protect those homes. Uh, So much invested in our homes, so many memories wrapped up in our homes. 
And Father, I just pray that you'll protect those, especially the pastor of this church, even though they've lost the church, protect the pastor and his place and all the others that are a part of that. Father, again, there's so much coming our way that we really don't know how to pray other than help us remain strong, faithful to you through it all. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. When I grew up, uh, the focus on the end times was about the wrath of God. We would, uh, it was how God would judge the earth, separate the saved from the lost into heaven and hell, burn the earth up, and then start all over with new heavens and new earth. We studied the seals uh, that are to be opened. We studied the bowls of wrath that are spoken of in the book of Revelation and the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That was our focus. We even had a song that we would sing during those times. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom. Trumpets will sound. And then I started listening to what we were singing. And the thought that there are going to be millions who face the wrath of God was not a happy thought. And that's what it's going to come down to. I know that is what's going to come at the end. But my focus has to transfer from things I have no control over to the things that I do have a measure of control over. A verse for the future. Jeremiah 29, 11. God says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. See, our hope is uh, for a future isn't built on God's wrath. Instead, it's built upon His goodness. But what if God's goodness comes wrapped up in bad? What does that do to our hope? You know, during hurricane season, you hear this all the time. It's sort of a modern proverb. Hope for the best, prepare for the worst. And I looked that up and I found a couple of explanations of what people felt like that, that was. And one was to have hope for a good result while simultaneously getting ready for a negative outcome. Having a positive attitude, but making sure you're ready for disaster. Now, my dad used that on me back when I started college. I was called to preach and I wanted to prepare so I headed off to get me a B.A. in Bible. My dad wanted me to get a secular degree, something I could fall back on in case preaching didn't work out. What he really was doing, what his plan was, is to give me something that I could count on in case God didn't come through for me. And you realize from that it's anticipating failure rather than success. Now, what may work as a strategy for hurricanes, and I agree, you prepare for whatever's going to come when those things are around, it creates an, a pessimistic outlook for life. At some point, we just need to burn the bridges, march forward. Cortez, 1519, led a contingency of 600 soldiers to invade Mexico. One of the plans that he had to keep the men focused forward on where they were going and not look for a loophole or a way out if things don't turn out like they're wanting it to was to get all the men on the beach, burn the boats. That way, they were all in, no matter what. Now, when it comes to trusting God, for the future, regardless of what that future holds, we have to be all in, no matter what. Illness can't override our trust in God. Disease can't override our trust in God. Death cannot override our trust in God. Whatever happens between now and the time Jesus comes cannot override our trust in God. But help hope for the best and prepare for the worst occupies our mind on investing too much time preparing for failure 
rather than for success. You see, when the Lord is working out his plans, there is no failure to prepare for. His ways are always best. We may go through bad to get to that best, but we never count on the, on the bad as being the final outcome. We count on the good God has planned even up until the end. That's our hope. Now, preparing for the worst uh, is an easy trap to fall into when we hear of wars and rumors of wars, or in our case, riots, disease, and maybe a fearful November coming up. But whether these things lead to the actual return of the Lord or just get us a few steps closer to that, the return of Jesus is still a good thing. It's not a bad thing to fear. It's not scary unless we are going to be among those who are left behind because the end of the world is going to be rough. And everything the Bible says about that means that those who remain will see the wrath of God poured out through the final judgments that are described. Now, why do I keep saying we're not going to face that? Well, Paul describes the procedure or maybe a, 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 a whatever, steps of, of how these things will, will fit in there. And he has the, the gathering together that we call the rapture, the calling away, before the Lord ever returns in sequence. Well, what else is prepared for us or, or there for us, the Bible says, are is an understanding of what God has accomplished in our life and how that has uh, implications toward the end. For example, Romans 1.18, in describing the whole realm of lostness, those who do not know the Lord, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. All, all the Bible is doing, all Paul is doing is, is characterizing two groups of people, and let's separate them and say, in this group here, this is the characteristic of what they have to look forward to. The wrath of God is against those who fit in the category of the ungodly. And then in Romans 2, 5, because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. That not only are they in this category, but the expectation is when the day of wrath comes, they're going to be the ones who are going to experience that. But look at Colossians 3. For it's because of these things, and he had a whole list of characteristics that describe ungodliness before he came to this verse. He said, for it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. Now he's beginning to separate into two groups. This group the sons of disobedience and the wrath stored up for them. But then there is a group who used to be that but is no longer that. And now this is what he says about that other group, Ephesians 2. Among them, over here, we all too formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of our flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath, children whose anticipation is the wrath of of God, even as the rest. But, big, big, important little word there. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, this group is a different category of people who have a relationship with God because of what Jesus did. So we've got two separate groups. Now listen to Romans 5, 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood in order to receive forgiveness and enter into the relationship, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were then reconciled with God and moved over here, 
through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. What were you saved from? Specifically, the wrath of God, which is righteous judgment against all sin. You were saved from that, so you were placed into this category. So that's why it's very clear for us to understand when God pours out his wrath, his children are not going to go through that wrath because that wrath is designed for the ungodly of this world, which again breaks our hearts to know there are people who have yet to receive the Lord as good people as you could look for anywhere in this world because they've never made that transition from there to there or still in that category. Now, when the Lord returns and gathers, gathers up those who belong to him, what we call the rapture, He will separate the lost from the saved. Know that that distinction has already been made in heaven. It will happen in an instant because the Lord knows who are His. You realize the moment that that transfer is made, this group becomes the children of God. God knows His children. When it's time for the rapture, He doesn't have to go through a checkoff list. To, to make sure he's got his kids on the list and not picking up someone who doesn't belong. He knows us, and he will in that instant receive us to himself. Jesus said, Matthew 24, For just as lightning comes from the east and fl- flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. You, you know how fast lightning goes, the speed of light. Here goes that flash from here to there, and it's gone. That's what he's saying in that instant when the trumpet blows, God will receive his children to himself. The suddenness of his coming will, <coughs> excuse me, will capture us away before we can prepare ourselves. In fact, the rapture isn't something you can prepare for. I made a joke when the guys were removing the skylights over here while they were uh, working on the, the roof. And I, I said, those are our rapture exits. Uh, you can't prepare for that. You, there's no way you can prepare for that moment. When it comes, it comes, and you're gone in that instant. Now, what we can do is to make sure we belong to him before the trumpet blows. That, that's what we have to make sure of. Make sure of our salvation. Make sure that I have trusted him as my Savior, invited him into my life, given myself to him, make sure I belong to him, because that's going to be the dividing line right there. I have been reconciled because I've accepted Jesus into my life. It, it won't be one of those moments that we'll, we'll hear the trumpet and all of a sudden be filled with concerns, and we're on the way up, and we say, wait, wait, I forgot my phone. We'll, we'll just go. And, there, and all the rest of our concerns and worries of life are gone in that particular moment, in that instant. Jesus' return was a compelling desire by first century Christians. They used this as their cry, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Maranatha meant come, and then they added come Lord Jesus. And so that was their cry. They, they spoke that. It was their understanding that that could happen even in their lifetime. And some wanted just to shut down and, and sell out, sit down and wait. And Paul wouldn't let them do that. He kept coming back to them and, and say, keep alert, keep awake, keep sober, be ready at any moment while you live each moment to the glory of God. You you have an attitude of anticipation. Someday the Lord will come. But in the meantime, I've got a life to live, and I have a God to honor, and that will be my focus during the meantime. That's what we do. He's out there. He's coming. That's not my concern. My concern is how I live to honor God today, and that becomes our objective. Not fearing, though things get fearful, not worrying, though thing, I have no solutions. Not panicking, though every fiber in me wants to run away. I will live to honor God. 
We don't wait till we hear the trumpet and then try to get our lives right with Him. At that time, we simply go. So prior to that, I want to be ready. I want to be ready in every way I can. So I live every day to His glory. Jesus said, Acts 1, 7, It's not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by His own authority. He also said, Matthew 24, 36, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. Apparently, God the Father has kept that date in his mind separate from anyone else knowing what he knows about the moment he will say, blow the trumpet, and things come to a conclusion. Paul added to that his own expression, 1 Thessalonians 5.1. He said, now as to the times or epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they were saying peace, maybe from riots, or while they were saying safety, maybe from COVID, uh, or maybe from a peace treaty that's being worked out even right now, um, the destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with a child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in the darkness that that day will overtake you like a thief, but you are sons of the light, sons of the day. We are not of night nor of darkness. Then let us not sleep as others do. Let us be alert and be sober. Keep, keep our focus upon the things we should focus on because we cannot control the other elements of what God chooses to do. But Paul uses an interesting expression in this verse. He says, it will come upon us suddenly like labor pains. Now, unless a baby is born by a cesarean section, even that is still maybe hard to calculate. You don't know the exact instant that baby is going to be born. Uh, there may be the signs. There may be the, 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 the labor pains have started. You, you, you can see that all the conditions are there, but you do not know when that baby is actually going to be declared born and comes out. In the same way, God keeps this a secret to us, keeps it so that we will look and say, you know, I see the signs, I, I feel the, the pangs, I, I believe things are drawing in on that, that's all he's going to give us, because the moment still is out there as a mystery, we don't know that yet. So here's what Jesus said, Mark 13, 7. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. Those things must take place. But that's not the end. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will also be famines. These things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Isn't it interesting how that expression keeps weaving itself through the story relative to the things about the end. You may not know this, I didn't, but the Jewish Talmud says there are ten earth, uh, birth pangs that the world must go through, the Jews must go through before the end. Number one is the Jews must return to Israel and the desert will blossom. Well, that's been going on since 1948. That's done. They're continuing to do that, but that's already one of the pangs that's, that's happened. Number two, the world will be in a state of complete segregation and degradation. Watch the news. That's what's going on right now. Uh, people trying to divide us into classes, into groups, into races. All of that's happening right now. Number three, the world will be without morals. Someone had said, when wealth is taken away, none suffer. When health is taken away, some suffer. When character is taken away, all suffer. And again, you watch the news. Even those we, we place in high positions and high offices in our country, and we watch their dishonesty come from their mouths and their actions, and we realize we're in the midst of a, a, a civilization without moral 
values. We've taken God's instruction away. Number four, truth will decrease and lies will prevail. Fewer wise, righteous persons. You, you don't see the Billy Graham standing up much anymore, the world-respected man and, and saying that you don't see that. Whenever they do stand up, like Franklin, his son, does, they come in and attack and try to take him out. We'll be with fewer wise, righteous persons. Many Jews will give up hope of redemption, which means they no longer anticipate the Messiah to come. The majority of Jews do not anticipate the Messiah coming any longer. Just a small section of the religious quadrant of those Jews. Uh, number seven, the youth will treat the old with disrespect. That's not hard to see. Number eight, learning will be rejected because people will desire a life of ease. The Bible will become an unknown book. Number nine, the whole world will turn against Israel. Recent agreement with Israel and the United Arab Emirates started a stir in that part of the world. But then when Serbia, Kosovo, and now Bahrain have added their names to the list of those who support Israel, that part of the world is about to go crazy because they don't understand how they can function with some of their own people embracing their lifelong enemy. Number 10, Jews will fight each other, religious versus secular. Now, I found myself rather naive when I discovered that most Jews are not religious Jews. They don't believe the Old Testament they don't believe their own traditional teachings. In fact, uh, 38% of worldwide Jews declare themselves to still be religious, which means 54% see itself as non-religious or secular. 2% characterize themselves as atheists, which means, at least in these numbers, 56% of all Jews declare themselves to be secular with, with only a commitment to, to Jewish uh, values, but not to Jewish religious traditions. They are a Jew and live by Jewish standards, but they do not hold those as being biblical commands for them to do whatever they do. Religious Jews, though, found this interesting have an expectation that the Messiah is yet to come. I looked into this and found that there is a Jewish timeline that they follow, and I wanted to explore that with you to kind of see what are they looking for and how does that tie together with what God is doing right now. Well, to do that, we got to go all the way back to Genesis. So if you want to go there or look on the screen, Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And then the Lord said, let there be, and creation began. Now, most people that believe that God created are in agreement to that point. It's after that that the opinions start flying as to, okay, what does that really mean? Because they go into the, the, the six days described in the next portion of chapter 1, and some will say that is to be taken literally. That means that there were six 24-hour days and God created all that there is. And others look at that and say, no, I think those are periods of time in which God did his work and came out with the same result. God created it all, but he didn't cram that into a six-day week and did it all at one time. One is referring to a young earth theory. The earth is only 6,000 years old. The other goes to a 
old earth theory that means the earth has no predetermined length of time that it's been here. Uh, the question really is, what, uh, was the introduction to, to Genesis a historical account? Or was it a summary that placed creation completely in God's hands? You see, when, when uh, uh, Peter was trying to explain things about Jesus coming and why he hadn't come yet, and people are getting antsy that he hasn't returned yet, Peter said, but do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. And then when you look at how prophets would, would write out their prophecy, it was not unusual for them to take a day and turn it into a year. So there are a variety of ways that a day and a year and a period of time is expressed in the Bible when it's simply wanting to make a statement that during this time frame, here are the kinds of things that, that God was doing. Well, neither one of those positions honor God's more than the other, God more than the other, and also neither one dishonors him according to your beliefs of whichever direction that you hold to. Just don't go down the road of evolution, please, that uh, says that uh, it got even Christian evolution. God started it, backed away and let it do whatever it wanted to do. That 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 puts God in an awful position because God designed it with a purpose. Not just to exist, he had a purpose in mind, and that purpose is described through the rest of Scripture of God having a message to be sent to his people to redeem them because he knew the day of wrath was coming down at the other end. Um, but we're using this creation idea to, to bring us back in context with the Jewish understanding of the Messiah coming. So I want to show you how that factors in real quick. Now, it, it's, it's true that the Jews rejected Jesus as their Messiah. Uh, read your New Testament, read the Gospels, uh, continue reading uh, in, in the writings of Paul. You'll, you'll see that the Jews as a group, as a whole, rejected Jesus from being their Messiah. There were believers within the, the Jewish community, but as a whole, the Jews rejected Jesus as their Messiah. So according to their understanding of Old Testament prophecy, he is still to come. Because they have him coming, and it's very clear that he will come. They just rejected when he did come. So they're still anticipating that day. Uh, it's interesting that there is a growing anticipation among the Jewish community within the religious Jews that this Messiah may be coming soon. Uh, for the past several years, or maybe even decades, the Jewish community there, the religious leaders within that, have reassembled a priestly order. And they've also reassembled... Levites, the, the priestly order were those who could do the sacrifices. The Levites were the one who assisted in that taking place. They're getting ready for something to come because they've got to have a temple to do sacrifices. And so they are anticipating something coming down the road. So they're getting ready for that and getting themselves geared up. But there's an ingredient that has been missing the whole time. It's essential for cleansing the priests and cleansing the elements of sacrifice. They had to have the ashes of a red heifer. A heifer is a female cow. Maybe that's a redundancy. Um, a cow, female. And, and the, the ashes from that cow consumed on an altar somewhere would be put together and from that they would be able to cleanse these men. There's no other way of cleansing them except with these ashes. Several, <coughs> several reddish heifers have been born in Israel in the past. But none has met the biblical criteria of the red heifer God had described in the Old Testament until October 2018. They had one born. And the criteria was that it would be a perfect red heifer with no more than two black hairs in his body. In other words, 
totally red. And then they would take that heifer at age two and turn that calf, which would be a cow by then, into ashes. Those ashes would be preserved until the time that they had a temple and then they could cleanse the priests and the Levites and the implements so that they could do the sacrifice. That meant to them, having the temple and the ability to resume sacrifice would lead to the return of their Messiah. And once their Messiah returned, there would then be the wrath of God that would come against all ungodliness. They're getting ready for that, which I find very interesting. Now, and also, there is something that we need to consider that brings us closer to us right now of how the creation of Adam plays into this timeline. They have a, a title uh, of, of something, Olam Hesa, Ol, Olam Hesa, which means this present world, uh, we might say extant or in the existence of. If you go to a cemetery and look at a tombstone and one of the persons has a beginning date and an ending date, they are no longer in existence, no longer extant. If the other one that's here beside them has a beginning date and not an ending date, you say they're still around. They are in existence. They are living in this present world. Well, that's what that word means, the present age. But they have, de have uh, defined that present age with a number. They say that the present age will only go for 6,000 years. So at the end of 6,000 years, in their calculation, that's when God is going to end the whole world and bring everything back to an order that he has designed. Now, to the Jews, this present world, this age of the world, this year is 56 I'm sorry, 5780. They're in the year 5,780. Uh, now, this coming Friday is their, their new year, Rosh Hashanah, and that bumps up one. So uh, as of Friday, it'll be 5,781. And, and you look at that and you say, okay, how did they come up with that calculation? Because that's really getting close, relatively speaking, to 6,000. Where did they come up with that? Well, let me carry you through this. It may take a minute, but Genesis 5, 4. Then the days of Adam, after he became the father of Seth, were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Seth lived 105 years. He became the father of Enosh. Then Seth lived 807 years, and he became the father, I'm sorry, uh, and he, he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912, and he died. Enosh lived 98 years and became the father of Kenan. And Enosh lived 815 years after he became the father of Kenan. He had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years. He died. Kenan lived 70 years. He became the father of Mahalalel. Now, if you follow, and that's not the end of it, but that's enough. If you follow that genealogy all the way through and add up all the numbers of how old was the guy when he had the son, how old was that son when he had his son? And you go from Adam to Noah, you come up with 1,656 years. Isn't that interesting? Then you continue on from Noah, Genesis 5, 32. Noah was 500 years old, and Noah became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, Shem was the one that the Bible then is going to start tracing lineage through. We started all the way with Adam, followed this particular lineage because they kept saying there's other sons and daughters being born, but we're following a particular lineage. Then we get to Noah. Noah has three sons, but we then follow Shem. So Shem is the one who we follow that through. Genesis 11, verse 10. These are the records of the generation of Shem. Shem was 100 years old, became the father of Arch, um, 
whatever, uh, two years after the flood. Okay, that gives you a time frame. Shem lived 500 years after he became the father of that son, and he had other sons and daughters. That son lived 35 years, became the father of Shelah. Now you follow that through, and they're doing the same thing as the other one. This father was at this age when he had this son. This son was at this age when he had this son. If you add all of those up, you go from Noah to Abraham in 390 years. Now, if from Adam to Noah is 656 years, then from Noah to Abraham is 390 years. Altogether, that adds up to 2046. There's not going to be a test, so don't worry about all these numbers. 2046. Abraham to David is roughly, nobody has a specific date of when Abraham was there. We do have specific dates of when David was here, but we don't know that. So we really don't know this distance, but it's approximately a thousand years. And then from David to Jesus is another thousand years. So you add all of those up and you're right at 4,000 years. Jesus was here 2,000 years ago. So if you add all of that together, what you come up with, an understanding that we're pretty close in our numbers to what the Jews were in their numbers when they predicted how long this earth would exist, it all fits together. Now what that says to me is that their Olam Haze, this present age is scheduled only to last 6,000 years. Because none of those dates are specific so that you can say accurately, this is the year 5,780. We're in the range of their final days as well. So next week we'll take that a step further. Do you see, do you see how all that's going on in the Bible is bringing us to a conclusion that God is stirring things toward the end? We don't know when that's going to be. We have no understanding of the time that God is working from. All we can do is look around and say, you know, the signs are there. The uh, birth pangs have started. I, I sense that, that we're on a direction that would lead to that. All we can say then is, it could be that God is getting ready to blow the horn. So what do we do? panic? No. There's nothing we can do about it. What we do is we take a step back and say, okay, Lord, I need to make sure I belong to you. I, I believe I have given my life to you, so Lord, I want to sit here and affirm to you that I believe I know you as my Savior, and when you say come, I'm coming. And affirm that, and feel strong in your faith that you belong to the Lord. If not, you need to step over here and say, God, I'm in the wrong group. Uh, I, I feel like this group is subject to wrath, and I don't want to be there. So, God, I want, to, I want to believe what the book says. I want to believe in what Jesus did. I want to give my life to you and move into this family over here. Because if you don't do that, you won't have time once the whistle blows. When the sound goes, we go. So if you're over here, please get out of there. Please cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to belong to you. And let him move you over into the group of his children. Okay? Here are our takeaways today. Number one, we will never know the day that the Lord will return. Because of that, we must First, make sure of our salvation, and then live every day to the glory of God. That's all I can do. I want to live today to honor you, God. Number three, more is happening now than at any time in history to say to us, Jesus will return soon. So our cry needs to become, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. I'm ready, and I hope you are too. 
Our hope is not in the future. Our hope is in the one who has planned out the future. Rest in that while all the rest of this stuff is going on. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for giving us a sense or a glimpse perhaps of of what might be going on behind the scenes right now to to get everything ready for the day that you're going to call it all in. Lord, we we know that our obligation is to is to live fully each day. Regardless of whether that's the day or not, we want to live each day to honor you. So Lord, may that become our our strong desire as we leave this place that our commitment is to walk faithfully, let you work out the future. Father, if you need to use us to help lead someone out of that wrong category and come into the category of your children, we're open for that. Lord, help us to to be faithful to speak when the opportunity comes. Lord, thank you that you've got all this under control and we don't have to worry about it at all. We'll just simply be those who will go when you say go. And until then, we'll stay and we'll stay faithful to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, This study is getting more involved than I anticipated when we went. Uh, So we'll see where we go next week. We're going to get back into some of this and then move forward. We're kind of ooching forward. We're not rushing forward. So stay with me as we work through this over the next little while. Don't know how long, but I do know that this is a very important time for us to consider these things. And we'll start looking at more of the the, uh, political thing, not in our country necessarily, but what's going on in the world, alliances that are being made that are going to affect Israel. And what affects Israel affects us. So that's, that's the tie-in there, and you have to know that. So never discount Israel. Always support Israel. Pray for Israel, because what goes on there is going to come back this way. So we'll, we'll look at some of that a little bit later. Doc, where are you? You're hiding. Thank you, Pastor. Appreciate it. Uh, we need to know about the end times. Um, we, our guest, we had guests today. I, I met a lot of uh, one-time guests today. Uh, Come back and see us again. We enjoyed having you. We hope you'll be back with us again. As we stand and dismiss us, we're going to bless the Lord one more time as we lift. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. God bless you. God keep you. If you wear your mask and you go outside, come back and see us again. God bless you. Oh, you give and take away. You give and take away My heart will choose to say Lord, blessed be your name Oh, you give and take away You give and take away My heart will choose to say Oh, blessed be your name Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. Give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name, oh, you give and take, you give and take, you give and take away, oh, my heart will choose to say, Lord, bless
blessed be, oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory, your name you give, you give and take, you give and take, you give and take away. Oh, my heart will choose to say, oh, blessed be your name, oh, you give, you give and take, you give and take away. Oh, my heart will choose to say, blessed be your name. 